uh, in this session we are looking at the issue of jihad. Jihad is very much with us. Every day we have a development pertaining to some atrocity committed in some part of our region. And uh, today you, uh, you know, today's papers carry about a story about an assault in Indonesia. A uh, few days ago it was in Istanbul. And uh, almost every other day there is a story and it is attributed to ISIS. And therefore there is a sense that ISIS is all around us. I have been requested right at the beginning to say a few, make a few remarks about political Islam. Political Islam is a seriously misunderstood term, so let me clarify it very rapidly. Political Islam is the attempt by movements to imbue a political order with Islamic values and principles. So any attempt to have a political order that is Islamic, that borrows from Islamic principles or is based on Islamic principles and there is a whole body of knowledge that, go, that constitutes the foundation of this aspiration. They are essentially, essentially, I am talking only about Sunni Islam, Shia Islam is separate. In Sunni Islam, they go back to the original texts of Islam, which is the Quran Sharif and the Hadith. And therefore, they are called Salafi because they, the ancestors, going back to the ancestors, the pious ancestors, Salaf as Saleh. On this basis, you have, you, when you go back to the origins of Islam, certain principles and values emerge, which are then seen to be uh, essential for the constitution of an Islamic state. In today's time, political Islam of our contemporary period effectively is the is from the 19th century ideologically where you had reform movements all across the muslim world but most importantly in the arab world represented by jamaluddin afghani muhammad abdu and rashid rada these people were attempting to marry the values and principles of islam with the modern values and principles they saw manifested in Western imperialism or in the Western order at home. So, a kind of bringing together the best of both worlds. What we discuss today in terms of Salafiyya is not linked with that movement. Today is, today's Salaf movement, Salafiyya movement is from post 1960s and has three manifestations. Number one, it is Wahhabi, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia suggests that it is, does not believe in political Islam, it does not believe in Islam being a factor in a political order. But actually speaking, as you will see and as we will come out in the discussion, Saudi Arabia is in fact a manifestation of political Islam, which does not allow for political activism. It believes in loyalty to the ruler and believes that the ruler knows best. But it is very active in projecting its point of view. Not only is it enforced within the country, it is also projected to other parts of the Muslim world. The activist movement, which is the mainstream movement, is the Muslim Brotherhood. That is another aspect of political Islam where you find from 1928 onwards an attempt seriously to marry the principles of Islam with modern grammar of modern politics. So you see there is a reference to constitution, elections, political parties, a representative parliament, human rights, etc. So over a period of 60, 70 years, 80 years, the Muslim Brotherhood has constantly reinvented itself on the basis of its own introspection and on what it has seen in the rest of the world. The third manifestation of political Islam is jihad. Some people call it jihadi salafism or, or salafi jihadism, it is the same. It basically means that you must have a political order based on Islam, but you should achieve it through violent means. The difference here from Muslim <coughs> Brotherhood is that Muslim Brotherhood rejects the use of violence in achieving your ideal Islamic state or society. The ideal Islamic state or society is the caliphate. 
So, these are the three manifestations of political Islam. What we are discussing in this session is only the third one, that is jihadi Salafism. Jihadi Salafism or Salafi Islam is to be found, is uh, or jihadi Islam. I would suggest that its origins lie in the Afghan global jihad. It is a very strange thing. It is all the great ideologues of jihad, most importantly Sayyid Qutb, they were, he was executed in 1966. It is really global jihad, the cynical use of jihad by three state powers, United States, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, to organize a global jihad in Afghanistan against the Soviet occupation is the origin of contemporary jihad. I would suggest to you that there are three stages that I have seen. The first is from the Afghan struggle up to 9-11. So you have Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda organizes itself and its culmination of its effort is the attack on the United States in 9-11. Before that there were various other attacks. After that, soon after that assault, in October and November the United States attacks Al-Qaeda and Taliban in Afghanistan and they go into exile from there. And this marks the commencement of the second phase of jihad from 9-11 up to 2010. In this period, jihad, you have a jihad central which is inspirational and ideological. But its operational bases are spread across the region. And therefore, you have a series of entities which have different levels of affiliation with the main very often if you read Abdul Bari Atwan, uh, uh, you know, it is called Al-Qaeda, the next generation. He refers to how a spectacular action of strategic value has to be done for you to be accepted as a franchise. So you had then the Al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. And then you had the emergence of various other groups a Shabab in Somalia, Boko Haram in Nigeria. All of them have been enfranchised to some extent. You have also Al Muhajirun in southern Algeria, affiliated to Al Qaeda. And then I would suggest the third stage of Al Qaeda, of jihad, is from 2011. I use 2011 because you see the emergence of Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. Al-Qaeda in Iraq had become the ISI, Islamic State of Iraq in 2007, after the death of Zarqawi. During the period of Zarqawi, it was called Al-Qaeda in Iraq and he had given baya to Osama bin Laden. His successor Abu Omar al-Baghdadi said that that was a personal baya and therefore the rest of the people in that group were no longer, uh, they were no longer adherents of that. And in order to indicate the separation of AQI from the Al-Qaeda, they called themselves the Islamic State of Iraq. So the two things, they declared an Islamic State. Okay, it did not, nothing happened. They had no territory. Indeed, the Sunnis of Iraq rose against them in Ambar province as part of their own awakening, defeated them. But because of the failure of the Iraqi government to accommodate the Sunnis, you found that they today, after 2011, shifted increasingly to the radical group they had themselves annihilated. The importance of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi therefore is that he not only took over the leadership and made it vibrant, but in a very short period thereafter, in 2012, he declared the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. This is the third phase of jihad in which we are today. Uh, we have two young scholars who are going to talk to us uh, on this subject. Each of them will speak for 10 minutes and after that we will have a discussion. Who would like to go first? Uh, so Kamar Sahib, uh, he will be the first speaker. Make your remarks. Uh, very good afternoon everyone. Thank you Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed. And thank you, Ananta Center, for having me here uh, to share my views on this very pertinent issue of uh, on 
proliferation of jihad in West Asia. <clears throat> Ambassador Ahmed has already uh, in very eloquently and very clearly demarcated the differences between political Islam, jihad Islam, and uh, uh, other streams of you know, Islam which are present in West Asia at this juncture. Uh, what I want to do is I'll try and uh, make two, three uh, points and then we can have uh, further discussion during the uh, question and succession on this. Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, conventionally we have uh, tried, uh, I mean, we have understood jihad as its roots lying in the idea of Wahhabism or it emerging from Saudi Arabia. And it is not entirely incorrect because uh, Saudi Arabia, when the state came, I mean, the doctrine of jihad was very instrumental in the formation of uh, the state itself. And it has used uh, jihad as an instrument to pursue its interest in different, different countries. Uh, and uh, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed has pointed out uh, how it uh, happened in the case of Afghanistan and in the other countries. <clears throat> but I'd like to say that in current scenario, uh, confining this idea of uh, jihad to only Wahhabi Islam or Salafi Islam is, is slightly problematic because we, we see that there are many other groups which do not really uh, have uh, you know, the, their origins in Wahhabi Islam and they also kind of uh, propagate a similar uh, you know, ideology which can, be, uh, which can be kind of explained as uh, armed, violent uh, type of political Islam which aspires to create an Islamic state, a prototype kind of Islamic state, and which is why uh, perhaps we see that the Islamic state calls itself, the so-called Islamic state calls itself as such. Uh, it is there in, uh, as has been pointed out, it is there in, not just in Wahhabi Islam, but at some point of time, even Muslim Brotherhood had this kind of an idea to pursue uh, uh, violence uh, have a prototype kind of Islamic state and this is something which is there in uh, even in Shia Islam. I mean one can see uh, uh, the ideology of Hezbollah. I mean they also have uh, at least the idea of struggle to create an Islamic state. Uh, obviously it completely differs when it comes to uh, Saudi Arabia uh, or Wahhabi brand of Islam or other brand of Islam. But this idea of jihad to create a state, Islamic state, is there not only in Wahhabi Islam, but in other streams of Islam. And at this moment, the, the kind of confrontation and conflict which we are seeing, it is very important to recognize that all of them are dangerous. One cannot really choose sides that one of them are, uh, one of them is, uh, you know, dangerous and the other is not. So, <clears throat> and having said that, I'll point, also like to point out that all different different states, I mean, not just regional players, even extra regional players also have used these kind of ideologies, they have picked and choose these kind of ideologies to extend their influence in different countries in the region. And this has happened across. Most importantly, if, 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 if one looks at in current scenario, Iran and Saudi Arabia, they have used these kind of uh, groups to extend their foreign policy objectives or to extend their influence in the region. For example, Iran has been, in, in, in the case of Lebanon, Hezbollah is a proxy organization of Iran. Similarly, if one looks at, uh, uh, I mean, Iran has been accused of uh, kind of propping up the Houthi militias in Yemen. And it is well known that Saudi Arabia has used uh, these kind of groups in different, different countries. And this particular, uh, you know, uh, use of jihadi Islam as an instrument to extend one's foreign policy objectives has intensified since 2011, since the outbreak of the so-called uh, Arab Spring. And uh, I mean, in the context of uh, Arab Spring, these two countries, both Saudi Arabia and Iran, have used their uh, influence, their proxies in different countries to either uh, and it's a quite a peculiar situation if one looks at it, to either support one group or to uh, 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 kind of oppose 
another kind of uh, jihadi group. I, I mean, I, I'll first come to Iran and then go to Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia is even much more complicated situation. Iran, for example, is supporting, uh, it, it's actually uh, uh, not just, it's protecting a secular regime in Syria, but it is opposing a secular regime in Yemen. It wants to bring down, I mean, it wants the Houthis to come to have, a, to become a player or to, be, to become a part of the government, which is again a, a Islamist, uh, Shia Islamist group uh, in Yemen, but on the other hand, in Syria, it is protecting, or it has become a kind of you know security guarantee for a secular regime, and it, a group which is a Islamist group is fighting for uh, uh, the survival of uh, uh, the secular, I mean Assad regime, with other groups which are again, uh, jihadi groups. And then there are other moderate Islamist groups also of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood kind and so on. When it comes to Saudi Arabia, the situation becomes even much more complicated. Saudi Arabia is kind of, uh, it's fighting with almost every kind of groups. For example, if, uh, and, and at some point it is also supporting jihadi groups. For example, it is supporting jihadi, it supported jihadi groups, it bankrolled actually the whole uh, 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 thing in Libya and to, to oust Gaddafi. At the same time, it is supporting uh, uh, Nusra kind of groups in Syria to uh, dislodge Assad regime. I mean, w one can really uh, debate whether it is a failure or whether uh, it's going to be I mean, eventually uh, Assad will go. Uh, I mean, has will have to leave to make way uh, for peace in Syria. But if we look at Saudi uh, kind of use of j jihadi groups, it has really been a very uh, kind of situation where it is either supporting them at some point. For example, in Yemen or in other uh, countries, it is completely fighting them. Uh, one group which is very prominent in Yemen is Al Qaeda. So Saudi Arabia is fighting Al Qaeda. Saudi Arabia is fighting uh, Houthi groups to uh, support a secular and moderate Islamist regime in or, or moderate Islamist group in Yemen, which it is not supporting in the case of Egypt. It's simil similar kind of like Muslim Brotherhood, which is now uh, which kind of has abandoned violence in the to uh, like uh, as a political uh, as a tool for achieving its goal it is completely against muslim brotherhood in egypt and in other countries but it is supporting similar groups in uh, when it comes to yemeni uh, situation and it is supporting obviously i mean the uh, uh, monarchical regimes in obviously gulf and beyond it is trying to fight islamic state and al qaeda at the larger level saying that they are a threat to not just peace and stability, but also to the internal security of Saudi Arabia. And when it comes to the domestic situation, Saudi Arabia, it seems is, fight, is completely against everyone. Neither polit Shia political Islam or Sunni political Islam is acceptable to Saudi Arabia. Neither moderate Islamists are acceptable to Saudi Arabia, obviously, and jihadi, the so-called jihadi groups, which are I mean, which, which actually, the, one of their main targets is to dislodge the House of Saud because that is where the holy places lie. So once you get hold of, or once, once you are get uh, uh, hold of this, these two holy places, you can gain legitimacy. So the situation is that since the Arab Spring, this, this use of jihadi groups to extend influence in the region has really intensified and this competition is leading to further uh, complications and uh, uh, more confrontation in the region and if, uh, if it continues there is a, a lot of possibility of completely destabilizing the entire region which would be a problem uh, for obviously I mean uh, any countries which have interest in the region including India and uh, we can discuss about Indian issues. I mean, if, if there are questions about challenges to India, I'll be happy to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you, Kamar sir. Uh, Mr. Zakir Hussain, I've asked him to explain to us the 
ideological moorings of jihad and uh, where they are coming from and where would they would like to go. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, just uh, my previous speaker has given some outline of jihad, how it is working, various groups are operating. Uh, it is estimated that around 1400 groups are operating in Syria and Iraq, apart from other groups working in different parts of the world. And uh, currently we see that most of the groups are seeking their baya or allegiance with two major groups, that is Al-Qaeda and ISIS, which has declared itself as Islamic State, which, which is perhaps which is a misnomer because it does not follow all the rule, credential which supports a caliphate, that is it. Uh, in my uh, slide, uh, I have tried to be earlier, I was trying to give a detailed thing, what is jihad, meanings, uh, like meaning, forms, mode of jihad, these are the outlines which I was interested to deal, but uh, as the chair said, to deal on the ideological part of the thing, I will confine to myself on uh, basically three, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, Sayyid Qutb, and Maulana Sayyid Abul Ala Maududi. These three uh, scholars have shaped uh, the concept of jihad, meanings of jihad, use of jihad, misuse of jihad. In that, uh, jihad is derived from the word jihad, which means strife. It's strife for anything, for a fair livelihood or for stealing your something you can strive for achieving your objectives. But of course, we are living in a civilized society, so we think of fair means. Then jihad is being divided into two parts. That is lesser jihad, that is physical jihad, what presently is jihad committing through violence. And uh, precedence was given to greater jihad that was complete con uh, control of your desire, that is your nafs. You have to control your desire. But what right now is happening that the Lesser jihad has superfeited the greater jihad. They are giving more importance to lesser jihad than greater jihad. And uh, Majid Khaduri, uh, a renowned Syrian Islamic scholar, has given how you can, what are the modes of jihad? He has given four, heart, tongue, hand, sword. Sword comes the last. Evolution of jihad from classical to modern period. The Quran, two surahs are dealing, that is uh, Surah Tawbah, repentance, and Alphan, Surah Alphan, that is the spoil of wars. And two other surahs are also dealing, that is Surah Nasr and Surah Abu Bakr. But these are smaller ones. In these, we can get the reference of jihad and uh, some commentaries written by like uh, uh, Maulana Wahiduddin. It's, it's a good one. And other various uh, authors have written commentaries. We can understand the meaning. Hadith and war pr practices of Prophet and his caliph. These are also giving the background of jihad. Now, what is the difference between these two and modern jihad? Earlier, to declare jihad was the prerogative of the states only. Individual can only participate when there is a call from the state. But what has changed, the narrative of jihad has changed. Now, individual can launch, the individual can form their own groups. They can declare jihad, they can recruit, they can give call of global jihad like this. This is, this is transforming, I will discuss it. And, uh, Coming to the uh, theology of jihad, that is uh, here Ibn Qayyim, he is a lesser known, but in one chapter I have written there, he has described how Prophet treated jihad and various people know less about him. There is a lesser writing, but writings are there. Second, that is uh, Taqi al-Din Ibn Taymiyyah. He is much used and misused, not for his theology, but for his fatwas. Even the confrontes, radical moderates are also supporting their views through Tamiya, and radicals are also using Tamiya to support their cause. And Abdul Wahab, I see that he has copied, much imitated Tamiya than Sayyid uh, Abul Ala Madhudi. He has a different sort of thing that, but again, he comes under uh, the system which, which, which talks to move with the system, uh, government, not going against the government. And uh, then, uh, uh, then uh, comes uh, Sayyid Qutb, and I, if you read his book, Milestone, really one will be surprised, and my personal experience going through that book, 
is that only a person who is personally tormented can follow his ideology of jihad. A normal person cannot follow it because he says that jihad is inherent in Islam because of two things. Islam is here to establish the divine rule, one. Second, to liberate the mankind, human being, humanity from the rule of man. That is liberating from the servitude of man. Means man -made, one has to liberate humanity from the man-made rule and implement the divine rule. So Islam is, is under perpetual jihad. Islam propagates to, to wage a perpetual jihad. It will never end. Even he justifies that during the Makkah period when prophet was uh, propagating, uh, was not adopting violent means, he was pro taking the social media and all these things to propagate Islam. He said that during that period also jihad was there, but due to some expediency, prophet was not using. Because people were less uneducated, Quraysh was very powerful, and he does not want to create blood bath in the region. So every house will blood the battlefield, and it will destroy the name of prophet and Islam. That's why he was not using jihad during the period of Makkah. But when he migrated, he made a hijra from Makkah to Medina, then uh, Surah came, then he started uh, uh, using the word jihad. But here, Maulana Madhudi says that, here people say, scholars say that there is a defensive jihad and offensive jihad. But Madhudi says that there is nothing, nothing like defensive jihad. Because jihad is jihad. You, you can't, defensive means you are going to comply with the existing system. So you are becoming a part of the existing system and you are not implementing, implementing the true uh, principles of Islam. And uh, like uh, last three uh, scholars, they have, like Faraj, Faraj they have misused, misused the fatwas of Ibn Taymiyyah, which I will, dis I will give during question and answer, because he has written a very comprehensive book, Neglected Duty. In that sense, he said that jihad is the sixth pillar of Islam. One has to wage jihad as he, he completes, he performs the obliga five obligations, like doing hajj, zakat, namaz, all these things. So from here, the concept of jihad has changed and the jihad has been converted into violence, violent form of uh, struggle. And uh, modern state, uh, uh, modern state, what is the modern, today we are living in modern nation state uh, where we rely the responsibility of, of maintaining peace and security over uh, United Nations and global organizations. So the responsibility in the modern nation state of Muslim state is to protect their homeland. Uh, now it's coming, why, why it is profiting in West Asia? Defeat of Arabs in 1976 war by Israel, this very one. It, it created a lot of paranoia in there. The Iranian revolution, it used political Islam. Second, use of jihad in Afghanistan, the success victory uh, of Mujahideen's uh, Failure of Arab awakening and democratic processes. We have to ponder on why Arab Spring, which is popular, and why it, is, it has failed. Why, if had it succeeded, what would have been the result? Responsibility of Western countries in stroking jihad in the region. Blow back terrorism. This has been very boldly accepted by Jeffrey Sack in, in his recent, recent writing that it, the, the, the jihad which is coming, the, the violence which is occurring in the Western countries is nothing but the blowback of terrorism, which is, has been created and supported by the Western countries in different parts of the world, particularly Afghanistan, and Syria, and other places. Support to the non-representative regimes is also important because why democratic process has been suppressed there. Arab Palestine issue and cold response of the global community. It is a sim long simmering issue which is creating this problem. Responsibility of Iran and Saudi Arabia. I also hold that these two countries are also responsible for spreading, supporting jihad in the region because they are fighting for the, re for the hegemony and for the balance of power and maintaining their hegemony over Shia and Sunni. Changing methodology of jihad, how over the period? I think you have to say that. I think you have to say that. I think you have to say that. We are familiar with this area. Yeah, I'm now coming to uh, uh, wind up. Uh, how? Just Ibn Taymiyyah is much uh, uh, 
I, I was interested to talk about Ibn Taymiyyah. His two fatwas are much used and misused. One fatwa he gave against the Mongols when they were attacking Damish in 2003. He, he gave fatwa that at that time both were Muslims. Mongols were, Ghazan Khan was uh, newly uh, Islamized and uh, the Mamluk Turks were there. Then there was confusion among the public Damish people that whether we should participate with them or not. Then Ibn Taymiyyah gave, no, you can participate, he gave fatwa, you can participate in the war against, you can launch jihad against Mongols because they are not pure Islamic, they are still following the pagan practices and using Yasa code, which is Mongol, Mongolian code of conduct. And they are, uh, they are rebels and they are fighting against established Mamluk Egyptian government. So that, that allowed people to fight jihad and they defeated. And second, he also gave uh, one ruling that uh, uh, during Ramzan, they, the Mamluk troops, uh, troops can break their fast and that uh, gave the, de they defeated the Mongols. One, one was there and second, how the moderates are using Moderates are using that Ibn Taymiyyah says that it is better to stay for 60 years under an oppressive regime than one night without a king. So, and thrice he was punished, thrice he was put into jail, but he never, neither he uh, revolted against the state nor he provoked the public to go against the state. He always complied with the state. That's why Muslim Brotherhood is, is also seeking uh, he's taking some lesson from Tamiya. Ibn Kardawi is a, is a great supporter in his supporting that uh, Muslim Brotherhood and Muslims can stay with uh, Muslim regimes. And he, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah has also given that Muslim can also stay with non-Muslim uh, governments, non-believers, non because he has given one example of Yusuf, Joseph. He, uh, Joseph, when he distributed the grains to the public during famine, though the rulers were unbelievers. So he said that Muslim can stay with uh, non-Muslim regimes. And uh, uh, while, the, uh, radi while the radicals are uh, using that, uh, uh, since uh, the Israel-Palestine war, war in 1967 created a lot of depression in Arab world, and they said they compared this Israel Palestine with Mongol and Mamluk Turk that they both are similar. So there is a there is a logic, there is a rule to fight against the government which is not following the Islamic rules. Earlier Ibn Qutb was following uh, Na Nasir, but when he did not implement it, uh, did not implement Islamic rule, then he said that it is not Islamic the jihad should be waged against him. And he was put under jail and he, for this he was hanged. So Ibn Taymiyyah, what I found that his, uh, his work has not yet been explored well. I was reading uh, some work has been published by uh, Oxford and they are compiling it into 35 volumes and still it is going on. So in that uh, conclusion they said that uh, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah has uh, been much criticized and less understood. And in 9-11 report, commission report, USA has also in indicated Ibn Taymiyyah as a responsibility for 9-11 uh, attack. And even Saudi Arabia in, in 2003 when there was attack in Saudi Arabia, then uh, one uh, editor said that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's children are doing this. So he was removed from his post. But if, if, what I think that Ibn Taymiyyah needs more uh, the more study and he was more pragmatic than other theologians. Great. Thank you. I apologize to you. you, you he had a full fledged presentation for an hour, but uh, sadly we have given him only 10 minutes. Main thing you would have the takeaway that you have is in 1500 years of Islam, you have of course the Quran Sharif and the Hadith. And over 1500 years, scholars have commented on various aspects of this. And there is one topic which has remained a consistent theme, that is about jihad. There has never been any consensus on this. Therefore, today, in the midst of contemporary politics and contemporary issues that agitate the community, it is very, very easy for people 
to draw upon any aspect of an early text or commentary to justify something that they are doing today. The complex, the issues that we have had with regard to jihad is to reconcile doctrine with strategic interests. So you have a doctrinal aspect and you have a strategic aspect. Most of the people who wrote about jihad in the 20th century were non-specialists. Sayyid Qutb, Abdul Salam Faraj, Shukri Mustafa, even Zawahiri, all of them had other jobs. All of, none of them had been through a rigorous training and, and education in Islam or in Islamic theology. They were political writers, but they were very deep, they were students, they were students of Islam, but they were not specialists in Islam. Uh, today you find that you are able to, you have the emergence of debates. Every aspect, every action that is done by a jihadi is debated and discussed. Today the principle, for example, when Zarqawi was carrying out his sectarian violence against the Shia, both Zawahiri and uh, Usama bin Laden cautioned him. They cautioned him on strategic basis, not on doctrinal basis. He opposed them and rejected their advice on doctrinal basis. But they told him that you are alienating the community, ordinary people are being killed, this is not the way you should treat the Shia, they are misguided Muslims. And it is our duty to educate them and bring them into the mainstream. Killing them will only harden their attitude to us. This is what Zawahiri said. At that time, Zarqawi opposed him and said that you are wrong. And, that, and then he quoted Ibn Taymiyyah and others. All of them, every great scholar of Islam has got, in Sunni Islam, has got certain portions against the Shia. From Hanbali to Ibn Taymiyyah to Muhammad bin Abdullah Wahab you have, which you can pick up and you can use against there. But you find that where strategic interests are concerned, there is a degree of caution which is not exercised. Today you have a similar debate between the ideologues of the Islamic State and Zawahiri. And you have a younger set of scholars who disagree with Zawahiri and there is an ongoing debate on this basis. So before we go further, I would like to ask my two panelists one or two questions. One is about the ideological aspect. What do you think really separates doctrinally the Islamic State and Al Qaeda? Zakir sir. Very briefly. JP, uh, as such, doctrinally, both are not very much at variance. But the modus operandi of both are different. Al Qaeda wants a gradual approach. First, it wants to prepare the individual, then society, then state. While IS, Islamic State, jumped to the final one that is forming the caliphate. And uh, in Al Qaeda, I find it is a mixture of radicals and moderates. Moderates wants to go with the state to change, to uphold the rights of women, minorities, Coptics, and all these. And at the same time, their final goal is to establish Islamic State. While uh, the Islamic, uh, Islamic State is vice versa. It immediately jumped. It tried to form a territory, uh, establish itself as a state, develop its state operators in a wider manner, try to generate income to self-sustain, become liberated, become independent from the donors and charities. And they started behaving like a proto, prototype state. While Al Qaeda is spread and amorphous, and it is uh, it, this uh, one one author has written that uh, uh, which is, who is which is known, known, known as Mankam, call for global Islamic resistance is Musab al Suri. He has written 1600 page document, call for global Islamic resistance. He said it is known as Mankam of jihadist. He said that after the crackdown and success, success of counter-terrorism, there should be decentralization, affiliation, and allegiances of various groups. And it should spread all over the world and prepare the individuals to live in Muslim atmosphere and, and, and fight against the Western influence. And they developed the concept of far enemy and near enemy. 
while IS is, 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 is also doing the same, but it does not say that I will attack far enemy. It says that if you attack on me, I will attack. Just like Israel is following. If you disturb me, I will disturb you. Don't disturb us, I will not disturb. Recognize my authority as is Islamic State. Until the Paris attack, we thought that Al-Qaeda has a global vision and Islamic State has a regional vision and that is focused on the near enemy. But then the Paris attacks happened. And since then you have had Istanbul and many other attacks. So you find that the Islamic State's vision has also changed. Also you have the emergence of uh, local groups and individuals who claim they are affiliated with the Islamic State, but who are now all over the world. They are a global phenomenon. And indeed on this basis, can you see a scenario where there can be a military victory over the Islamic State? I think it's very difficult to really defeat uh, Islamic State militarily at this stage. I mean, in the sense of larger, uh, 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 I mean, the way it has spread out to different countries. And I mean, there are so many franchises of I mean, Islamic State. There are so, there are so many of them. That's, and, and if one looks at right now, they're mostly concentrated in Iraq and Syria. And the war, I mean, the conflict is going on for such a long time, but I mean, there's not much of a, much of in terms of a, a clear cut military victory, I mean, over Islamic State. So in the current scenario, it seems very difficult to kind of clearly defeat Islamic State militarily. Yeah. You want to, you have, yes. Uh, okay. Currently, right now, these powers are uh, sitting and deciding to finish IS, it will never happen. Because, but again, I say that if politically, political Islam goes, then they will emerge in other form. And the solution lies that uh, democratic process in this region should be strengthened. Only then the people will Indeed. not support them. UN said that more than 30,000 fighters from all over the world have joined IS and other groups. Why this is happening? Uh, we have uh, got some extra time because of the allure of this session. So we, are, we will be here till 1.15 or thereabouts. And uh, therefore, please. If you don't mind, we'll use the mic. Uh, there's one, right. I was invited by the Aligarh Muslim University. I'm a Hindu Brahmin. Uh, to, to that they made first international conference on intellectual crisis of Islam. Is there an intellectual crisis of Islam? What is real Islam? And Islam is a dichotomy. One is, one hand they say it's a religion of peace. Second is thing, <coughs> this right from Rasul down, you know, uh, my perception will be <laughs> different. I have seen for establishing, you know, this holy war has been taken. And no war, can be a peaceful mean of propagation of anything. Anyway, this again I beg to say that is my perception. Now, what is real Islam? What is intellectual crisis? What the young people are thinking? Because in a tormented world, greatest sufferers are who are yet to born and who are young, who are now technical swabi, scientific swabi, they understand things in a very really different way than in a religious progression which we are having. Okay. Should we have a world, Khalifat world, or any other religion world, or a world without any God? It's a scientific yes. world. Kindly elaborate and explain. We'll do that, yes. Uh, huh, Sanjay? role of money in supporting? Is it, is it purely ideological or is there money also involved or other ideologies? Yes. 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 Not jihad. Three times of political <laughs> Islam or Islamism. First you started with the Afghan war. Oh, the three stages. Or three, three stages. stages. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 
See, if you look at it, the first, the Afghan war, clearly, which you said was a cynical manipulation by the Americans, the Saudis, and the Pakistanis. Okay, so here you had certainly a U.S. support for what they thought was the battle against Soviet Union in Afghanistan. The second stage, which you said was 2009-11 uh, till about 2011. Now, in that stage, Al-Qaeda, or the second stage, got franchised to in Maghreb, uh, Arab Peninsula, etc., Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, yeah. and so on. Deterritorialized and... Uh, yeah, de decentralized yeah. franchises. Decentralized and deterritorialized. Now, during this time, obviously, the U.S. was against this phenomena. I mean, they were trying to battle Al-Qaeda, whether they were partly successful or not as a different matter. In the third stage, which is post Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, 2012 onwards, with the ISIS, which has actually used social media effectively. I mean, you know, you were talking earlier, we were, when we were talking, you said 7,000 Europeans are supposed to have come in and so on. So how is it that with US control over the internet, why is it? Is there a tacit sort of letting it go because is there a long-term game here? Because I cannot understand that with all that we hear about Snowden revelations, etc., etc., that ISIS's use of the internet and electronic means of communication is it is not possible to be able to block that. Any other? G. Hello, um, Shoban Chakraborty from Kolkata. Uh, this question is particularly to Dr. Zakir Hussain. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you provided um, so many definitions of uh, jihad, uh, which are very illuminating. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I was just wondering if you can tell me what is your uh, definition of jihad, uh, and what do you think? What do you think is the correct definition of jihad? Right. Thank you. Uh, we, if you don't mind, we'll pause here and very rapidly respond. I'll take the first one, and one about the holy war you can respond to, and the one about the ideological aspects you can respond to, and then we'll wrap it up quickly after that. So about the intellectual crisis. There is a sense, and there is a lot of literature in this, both in the Arab world, in the Islamic world, and in the West, that there is a crisis. Fukuyama wrote about it, that there is a crisis of Islam, that Islam is struggling to come to terms with modernity, and it's carrying a huge baggage of humiliation, defeat, uh, dis, you know, disenfranchisement, marginalization, etc., the loss of dignity. Uh, he has referred to the creation of Israel in 1948, defeat in 1967, etc. The whole narrative of defeat and depredation. And the betrayal sensed across the region is at the hands of their rulers, who are actually subserving Western interests. And this is now the response. Because you do not have a situation where you can freely mobilize yourself for oppositional politics, the only way out for you is to go back to your authentic roots, which is jihad, and unleash this. So there is this thing. There is, a, there is an interview I read with a, with a dissident Gulf scholar, or scholar activist he's called, he's now in exile, who has discussed this aspect about the intellectual crisis. And he says that the young people have so many aspirations in West Asia, but the only situation you have in West Asia is either tyranny or terrorism. And because you don't have a third option of normal politics, you have people who have taken to terrorism against tyranny, which is what my colleague also had attributed or talked about. There is this sense, and this is my personal sense as well, having lived in the region for long, that the absence of popular participation in the political order is perhaps at the root. And added to this is a sense of betrayal from the, from the leadership and their very close affiliation with Western interests. This is the way I, have, I would look at this region and the politics and dynamics of this region. Uh, with regard to resort to holy war, perhaps you may like to. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, the whole idea of holy war is uh, I mean, it's quite complicated. I mean, 
as I mentioned earlier during my presentation, that there is this idea that one has to create a Islamic state through a waging war. I mean, in the in the early period of Islam, holy war was supposed to be completely defensive, or in terms of uh, taking the message of Islam to different parts of the world. But I mean, currently it's it's in a quite a complicated uh, kind of a situation where uh, there is not much of a, a clarity in terms of uh, where and how to wage holy war. And there are obviously individuals and the uh, uh, groups which have some sort of a, a complaint or any kind of a, uh, you know, uh, as uh, was mentioned by other panelists. So they use these kind of ideologies which are there in Islamic theology to kind of extend their own personal interest. And that has been used by different states to kind of uh, extend their uh, objective. So, I mean, the whole idea of holy war, which is quite a complicated kind of situation. I mean, one cannot really say that the whole uh, holy war is mandatory or not. I mean, in the Islamic theology, some of the uh, scholars and theologians do uh, have this kind of idea, for example, Madhudi and Sayyid Qutub, who uh, say that holy war is something of a continued uh, effort, which has to be continued throughout to change the world to a divine rule. So, I mean, yeah. very You could talk about uh, the role of money yeah. and the ideological, uh, what you uh, say. Yes, of course, the role of money is a great incentive. Uh, According to one estimate, the law Saudi Arabia has spent $86 billion to finance, to fund madrasas and various institutions, which is propagating one sort of Islamic ideology, which is, which is very much only one fourth. Even in Saudi Arabia, Wahhabism has, is followed by only one fourth of the people. And uh, in 1990, uh, uh, if I am correct that Prime Minister Narsimha Rao conducted a seminar here, and he, in that seminar, it, it was emerged that 90% of South Asian Muslims are from Sufism. That does not believe in violence. Uh, similarly, Iran is also using its money, and one of the fears of Gulf monarchies is that Iran should not get money to finance the, its own brand of uh, organizations. So money plays a very important role and since 19, since the first oil boom, this system has started in the world. So money has a great role. And uh, why IS, IS is termed as the most richest rebel group in the world. It has presented a balanced budget for 2015. It, it has an income of one billion dollar. It has captured various, uh, it is mobilizing. There are several studies. We have written one book. It's, uh, very soon we will be coming out very comprehensive on how they are financing and from where they are managing their resources. And they have also started the subsidy system, giving people to the region from where they are getting the money, who are purchasing the oil, they are, who are purchasing the antiques. These are various dimensions of creating money. And Al Qaeda initially was funded by charities and wealthy people. Coming to Saudi Arabia, the major complaint of USA is not against the government, but against the rich people who are donating lavishly. Even the 30, some pages were out in 9-11 uh, commission report. In that, after reading so much, I sensed that some wealthy houses of Saudi Arabia were funded. And similar thing is happening in Iran also. So states are least interested to be labeled as like that, but might be state, might be provoking them, we don't know. To now coming to the real Islam, real jihad. So for me, uh, you, you see various shares of Islam, equality, brotherhood, eating together, marrying, all these are the various features of Islam which was quite new in the world at that time. Now it has become a part of human rights. 
So for me, living a corruption-free life, violence-free life, this is nothing but a struggle towards a fair life. Is jihad. I don't believe in violence. What I will get by killing? I should purify myself. If I am honest, I should not also put my burden on others. That look, I am honest. I am honest for myself. I want this way of life. I don't want that my life should be cited as a violent. Like I have mentioned here, I have uh, the literature. These are various literatures written by various people as Ambedkar said, nowhere having Islamic background. Al Faraj was engineer. He wrote these various. I, I collected these. These even Al Zawahiri was a doctor, exonerate narration. He wrote that book. All these are the, these writers have misused Al Taymiyya fatwas for their to justify their own uh, purposes. You can retain this. Yeah. About the internet, my main source about uh, the subject is Abdul Bari Atwan's book, The Digital Caliphate, Islamic State, The Digital Caliphate. Yes. He has debated several chapters discussing the use of social media, uh, both the style and the content. In terms of technology, he has pointed out that it is the most modern and extremely slick productions. Uh, as good as any Hollywood production. He didn't say Bollywood, he said Hollywood production. <laughs> and uh, second is the messages. And he has given very interesting details of the messages that are different for different constituencies. In my last article in the Asian Age, two days ago, I have given the three different kinds of people who are attracted to the Islamic State. There is a small, very, very small religious group who see the Khalifate as the realization of their dream. And one of them quoted in a scholar by a scholar, another scholar, has said that I have dreamt of the Khalifat the way the Jews dreamt of the Holy Land. I think it's a gross exaggeration, but this is the way he has articulated it for himself and he's attracted by it. Uh, there are, but the overwhelming majority are people who have no clue about Islam. And indeed, the appeal to them is not Islamic at all. It is about comradeship and about being involved with a cause larger than yourself. And the uh, people have written that they are marginal, the court is marginal misfits in their society. Several of them in the Arab world itself and also in the Arab diaspora. In the Arab diaspora, you are at the bottom of your, in France, you are at the bottom of the social ladder. Many of them are going through personal crises of identity. So again, this is all new territory, in, in fact, for scholarship, we are learning on the job. We don't, the past literature is not helping us because it's a new phenomenon in our life. Up to now, the diaspora used to seek to accommodate itself in the chosen land. These people are rebelling against that. And Olivier Roy has written that these are to be seen as anarchists of the 19th century and the Badr Mainov of the 20th century. And he traces it to a generational gap. Another one has said, so even, even Karen Armstrong denies any religious role in this. There is one scholar who has said, you know, Graham Wood, and he became very controversial, that he said Islamic State is Islamic, very Islamic. But he has been, there have been others who have attacked him, saying that uh, it's not Islamic at all. It is, somebody has called it a criminal syndicate based on money. Uh, so, I, you know, you have asked this question earlier also, why is it going through? Why is it not being clamped down? Uh, I don't know enough about social media technology to be able to answer this, but if you read the book, constantly sites set up by these people are being blocked. In a year, more than 45,000 were blocked. Uh, the British block out their messages to the extent of several hundred, several thousand a week. So there is this happen. But they have also explained how they beat the system, how they first latch on to a very popular site which is already there. But when you access a site, you really get their messages, their videos. Then again, they use a lot of Skype. They use WhatsApp. I am not qualified enough to be able to elaborate on this. Uh, uh, yeah. Sir, the point I was making was that we know where the, we know that the gateways for most of this traffic, I mean about 90% of this traffic is, yes, is the United States, other than you know, yeah. and we also know that almost all of these service providers have had, 
you know, the, the U.S. government has been able to uh, talk to them and has access to what is going mm. through. I mean, today, this whole thing is done on the basis of metadata analytics. And so, even if these guys are, uh, you know, switching around and things like that, it should be possible, number one. Number two, the, you know, the phenomena of the uh, marginalized Muslims in, say, in the case of Paris and so on, and we've seen in Brussels as well. But this phenomena is, has been in existence. So these people who are suffering from an identity crisis, whatever, they are Muslims. They've, their parents worked hard to try and make an economic life. These fellows feel they don't get their due, etc. And so therefore, the seeds of alienation through the mosque, through the internet, and so on get planted. But it still seems amazing that so much of this can go through unless there is actually something else behind it. I mean, that is what I wanted. I don't, uh, you have mentioned it. I, I don't have evidence of that. Indeed, my, uh, my own understanding is all across West Asia. Every government has mounted a major counter-offensive to appeal to the same constituency to say, to speak about the evils of jihad and about this and give an alternative message. Giving an alternative message has now become an important element. Uh, if you don't mind, we will have to clo close now. Very quickly, I will summarize that jihad is very much with us. It has manifested itself in three ways. Number one, through transnational uh, entities like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. As you know that Al-Qaeda is also alive and kicking. But what you do see, and this is the literature which is there now pervasive, that there is a competition between the two. It, is, it can be perceived in terms of a generation gap between the older people, the older ideologues and the older activists and these young tigers, young uh, Turks, whatever, actually raring to go. Atwan says that the young recruits who come from outside, their average age is between 15 and 20 for boys and 18 and 22 for girls. So you are looking at extremely young people uh, who are attracted to the jihad. Uh, I have suggested, Atwan hints at it, but my feeling is that with the death of Zawahiri, it is very, very likely that the two institutions will coalesce. I am saying coalesce, I am not saying they will become one. They will coalesce, there will be a caliphate and you will have large numbers of of, uh, of autonomous entities that are in different places, inspired by the Caliphate, but perhaps carrying out carnage on their own in different places. Can, is there a military solution? The sense of the panel is that there is not. There is no military solution. I recall here the assault the Americans carried out against Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda dispersed into the mountains, decentralized itself, and as uh, Olivier, no, uh, another scholar has said, they also deterritorialized, and therefore you have the transnational entities, you have local functioning, and then you have the lone warriors. Lone warriors inspired by the internet, very often acting on their own, occasionally getting a minimum training from lashkar e or somebody, and coming back and carrying out uh, a mission. So you have a pervasive, that means jihad is our neighbor, and it is very much around us. It is, we have a sense of menace, which is very much there. The way out, we have no ready solution. The state entities generally resort to war. You have a target, keep on bombing it. But I was giving you the example of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda dispersed and today, you know, after all the bombings, they are today, I would say, 2015, 2016, they are more robust than they were in 2001. So that means there is something to be said. We have argued, we have suggested the that the solution for the intellectual crisis, for the crisis within Islam, for is lies in political reform. That the Arab world today, from Morocco to Yemen, is the last entity in the world, besides possibly China, last entity in the world where there is no popular participation. Asia, Africa and Latin America have in various degrees and with various degrees of success, popular participation. Unless you have that, you do have, you do generate amongst in certain people a sense of frustration and some of those people can take to violence. 
either on their own or as part of larger entities. We will pause here and there will be things to say later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry I cut, but you know, yours is a very substantial presentation.